It was intended for the human to support the machine, the machine to support the human at work. AI means something different to anybody you talk to, which is wild. This is AI or die. Hey everybody, welcome back to AI or die. It's been a month. There's a lot of AI news that we want to cover, but as always, Let's introduce ourselves. What's we got going on in our life? What's new with the line AI? And then in just a bit, we're going to have Maria Villar join and talk to her about all of her work and data strategy. On my side, we are nearing the end of the school year. My wife's a second grade teacher. So she's going to have me come in on the last day of school and be the mystery reader. So I'm going to go in and read a book to her class of second graders. And I kind of want to pick like an AI book or something like that just to get them up on it turn it into a, a whole event where it's like, hey, Alani eyes for the kids. You got people out here reading to the kids for AI and stuff like that too. So got to start them early, you know? You yeah, start, start them early, you know, start freaking them out. Read uh, <laughs> Weapons of Math Destruction to them, you know, like get them real paranoid early on. Um, but that's it. I'm just prepping for summer, getting excited for it. We're going to go down to Savannah, Georgia in a month or so just to get some beach time in. And we're going to visit some family later in the summer too. I'm sure we'll talk about that on a future episode, but that's what's going on with me. What's going on with you, Reagan? What's new with you? Just trying not to look like an alien over here. I know you got like this okay. green view. <laughs> it's like I've I've been trying to explain this to people, but when it's super sunny out in the summer, the sun just beats on like all this foliage and trees and you know garden we have in front of my office, and it's um, I have a massive wall of a window. And so when it beats down on the greenery, it like reflects on my face and I end up looking like an alien. So it's pretty great. So I tried to fix it. I'm, I'm not moving because <laughs> I feel like when I move, it changes. So besides that, good. Obviously got married since we lasted an episode. <laughs> so yeah, new last name is Blyly. I got to change that on, on this podcast <laughs> at some point. But yeah, good. Everything's good. Life is good. Good. How about you, B? What's new with you? It's good. Just getting ready for a summer full of travel, going back and forth to the States and then a couple spots. Got a wedding in Dublin. It's all like wedding travel. So it's going to be a lot of fun, family, friends, all that good stuff. So just kind of gearing up for that. It should be a good time. Nice. Nice. We also, in the Columbus, have a new office as well. So we had some fun this past month getting that all decorated and set up too. So that was that's always fun. New chapter to turn over. That's what our fourth office at this point. It's it's been a glow up for sure. So it's been it's been nice to get that all situated too. Third, and I found out I I don't know how to put decals on windows, so <laughs> I won't be doing that ever again. Oh, you're not counting the cohatch as office number one. That was kind oh of yeah, fun. I guess that's true. I yeah. guess that's true. Yeah, if you guys ever visit our office, please make sure to look at the sticker on the door, Reagan. That's pride of her work. She did a great job on that. I love it. Okay, so let's get into the news. There's a lot happening, frankly. I have some articles pulled up that I want to get your guys' reaction to as well. We have some updates from Google. We have some updates from Microsoft, even especially some things coming out of the EU side of things in terms of regulations they're setting. So starting with Google, because I kind of want to go in chronological order here, they made a significant update recently at their build conference related to AI and search. So with the emphasis that they're going to start prioritizing, really gen ai results over actual website links so when you go into google the thought is if we can find relevant info and provide it to you as text just at the top of your search get your answer and get on with it you don't have to go and find through the websites you know where your actual answer to your question is and this has significant implications because how does that impact web traffic to certain websites how does that impact the answer that folks are getting from an ethical standpoint and ultimately, Google makes a ton of revenue on ads and on SEO. So it's kind of impacting kind of three key areas with how we engage with the internet. I think it's super interesting. I want to get your guys' thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's a smart move. I've been using it in beta because this is crazy to see how useful open AI is. Like, cause I use chat GPT on my phone, even like personally now instead of Google searching, cause it is just such a better experience. So like, I think it's a smart move on Google's part because Google is starting to feel like archaic, which is crazy. Cause like, it's yeah. so, so powerful and so useful, but like, that's, you know, the level of improvement with something like chat GPT for like basic finding information. So I think it's a wise move. I've also been like seeing it in beta and it's been effective because it does save you a lot of time. I think the implications are going to be huge, of course, when you look at ad revenue and like, how is that going to affect how we create content on the web? But I just think it's a smart move. Otherwise, Google would become disrupted, which is pretty wild to be even say that phrase together. You know? Yeah, I think it's such a better user experience. I just posted 
on LinkedIn about using, you know, ChatGPT, the new 4.0, which I know we're going to talk about here in a second, but I just use that to basically help in, in gardening and identifying different plants and determining, you know, good spots to plant certain plants. And it's just so much easier because you just take a picture, you know, it gets uploaded, it interprets everything in the picture, you can ask questions around it. And it's all the things that I would Google and like click on links and read articles and go on YouTube and, you know, try to, it would take me like way, way longer. But the fact that they're creating that user experience inside of ChatGPT that's cohesive, that's multimodal, you know, I can talk to it, I can send pictures, I can message with text. It's a much more fluid experience than Googling. So Googling things and searching for things. So I I agree. I think if they don't completely change the paradigm of user experience, this is why I love competition because it kind of forces people to relook at the paradigms that they've been stuck to for a long time. Obviously, Google has made some changes um, to search over time, and those changes have been better user experiences, but now it's a full paradigm shift that they're looking at. And I agree, they're going to have to You know, so many people depend on the norms of Google search and inbound strategy and, you know, their website traffic and what that looks like. And so I think that whole, that whole essence is going to get reinvented as well. And Google argues from their testing, it leads to greater usage of searching the web. If you can get your answer faster, they still argue that folks still click the links to dive deeper into a topic to do more further research and also... If you get answers more quickly, you're engaging with Google more frequently because you're getting more answers and you get a greater experience out of it too. Yeah, for sure. I think the links and the reference links are something that, you know, Perplexity incorporated into their user experience. It's something that we keep getting requests from our customers on when they're building out their own experiences for AI, especially generative AI internally, is that they want to be able to link to specific references of that information so they can kind of verify it or dig deeper if they need to. So I agree. I think people will still click links. Your point on competition is interesting because Microsoft, and we'll talk about ChatGPT 4.0 and OpenAI next, but Microsoft to try and beat Apple to the punch because Apple apparently in fall has a big announcement with updates to Siri and partnership with OpenAI. Microsoft announced yesterday that they're going to be shipping PCs with essentially their AI branded co-pilot built into the entire machine, which basically keeps it to their words, a photographic memory of every single thing you do on the machine to basically recall anything you might want to reference or pull information on. That'll be in machines shipping in June. And they say, you know, users can opt out by going into the settings menus and turning it off. But by default, these will be turned on on all of these PCs they're shipping across Asus, Acer, a lot of their hardware that they're sending out to. Super interesting in that it's embedded in the actual hardware side of things now from the jump. Yeah, I feel like this is the AI era era where it's like creepy, but sounds useful. You know what I mean? Where it's like, that sounds super sketch, but also could be really, really useful. So it's like it's back to the internet age of like, should we, is it worth it? <laughs> you know, like, but I think this will be really interesting to see because it would help so much to be able to go back. And it's like almost like the API integration kind of phase that we're going through with SaaS products is a similar concept of like getting information from system A to system B is the really hard part. So if Microsoft can kind of wrap all the information you're putting into and out of your computer, like that might be very valuable. Um, it's also interesting that Apple and Microsoft are both using open AI. So I think that is going to make OpenAI very successful, not the, even more successful than they are today to get in that consumer product space as well. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where they start to sit in the stack because they were really forward facing. They started with application layer and model, right? Yeah. They put, they were building models, then they built ChatGPT, that application layer. That's what got everything kind of boomed and lots and lots of usage. And so Now it's interesting to see like where they're going to navigate from here because now they're starting to move behind the stack a little bit and enable others and even further into into infrastructure as well. So that's just, it's just really interesting to see where they're going to double down. And with that, OpenAI with their GPT-4.0 got into a bit of trouble in this past week. I don't know if you guys have seen that movie, Her, uh, 2013 movie directed by Spike Jonze starring Joaquin Phoenix, kind of ahead of its time. So 10 years ago, having basically Scarlett Johansson voice the AI assistant that Joaquin Phoenix falls in love with in the movie. Either way, 
OpenAI reached out to Scarlett some months ago, asking for her permission to use her likeness, her voice for GPT-40 as an option. And, you know, she declined the offer, but they still released GPT-40 with a voice nearly identical to hers. And, and there's this whole release about her opinion on it, her not giving her likeness away to them and her not agreeing to it as well, too. So interesting how with Microsoft growing into using AI into their machines, OpenAI expanding into using voices, you know, whatever they can grab onto as well. I think there's a lot of these growing pains and ethical considerations that I know OpenAI is kind of dealing with now too. What are your guys' thoughts on using like likely likeness of people's voices and and whether agree you disagree, they're going to potentially use it in some way or another anyways. I just find it so interesting because I feel like OpenAI has been very thoughtful or at least perceived to be thoughtful about this licensing structure and trying to protect creators and trying to protect original works and trying to get licensing structures in place with, you know, Stack Overflow and and Reddit and whoever else. <clears throat> so I, I think, I, I feel like they've been at least, they had, they've had an outward facing perception of being, of caring about this. So I find that to be really interesting that they were, you know, so bullish on still launching that and then all of this backlash obviously is happening. And and if you recall back to August, I was in DC for the voice and AI conference and <clears throat> there were a ton of voice actors there that were present and they were basically talking about, you know, their rights as voice actors and not having their voice be used for training purposes and and at least getting paid or c- coming up with some licensing structure for them to get compensated if it is used. So I do think that that's going to be really interesting. I did hear on the All In podcast over the weekend that there's a couple of startups who are trying to work on a licensing marketplace for creators and model builders and trying to help centralize those efforts so that if you are a creator and you are fine with your stuff being used in model training efforts, you know, you get compensated accordingly. So I think that'll be really interesting too. Yeah, I just wonder if they could have modulated it more, or made it farther away. Right. Or it's kind of it's kind of interesting to think through, like how do you test to see if it's close enough? Like I think it was like Bruce Springsteen had to like play the guitar on stand one time to prove that he wasn't copying his own songs or something like that. It's like what is the litmus test to say that something's different enough to say that it wasn't like a copy off of it? You know, that's so what, is- what they're dealing with in co- in this these copyright battles and copyright infringement is literally how is it close enough? I know we personally have addressed our legal counsel just to put a, you know, a process in place internally around copyrights and copyright infringement and modeling efforts and training efforts and things like that to make sure we're protected. And so I think if companies aren't looking deeply into that, they should be because there's got to be at least a kind of rule of thumb in place because it has to stand up in court. I mean, and the way they do it is how close is this thing to this other thing? (laughs) just crazy. It's also just such a weird art imitating life moment where they, I don't know if they took inspiration from the movie, but they found something about her voice as like the ideal type of voice for how people would want to engage with an AI assistant in that way too. It's just funny that creatives picked it for a movie choice in that way, but they're kind of leaning into that with their own decisions around the voices they use for these apps that are hitting millions of people in that way. It's just interesting how some voices are perceived as better than others or more preferred with how you engage with an AI. Yeah, it's funny because I know my uncle knows the person that voiced Alexa and it was like a whole like, there was a whole selection process and there's Alexa and like different, you know, the different like flavors of it or, you know, how it tones and they had different languages and they all like meet and hang out. But like to this day, my uncles are not allowed to reveal, they figured it out, but that person's not allowed to share that they're the voice of Alexa, but they're like at parties and they're like purposely having Alexa go off so they could like kind of have other people catch the fact that it's actually her <laughs> that's doing the voice. So it's kind of funny to think through like, how do you protect that and treat that as like almost IP around those like voices that are unique for those experiences going forward. Yeah, I think it was intentional that they did that. You know, Sam Altman had a tweet that just said her the movie, like he's a fan of the movie, maybe or something like that. Yeah, I mean, like they're they're literally trying to build AGI, like that is their mission. So, you know, I don't think it's surprising that they would find something that has a cultural reference that people could get that you know would closely associate with their mission. 
ex machina actress right now is kicking herself. She's like, why not me? You know? <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> Those future movies that came out 10 years ago. Yeah. Now being used. Speaking of that, likeness being used and, and privacy in that way, the EU just posted an AI act for basically their block of 27 countries. And I want to read this to make sure I get it right. It basically imposes strict transparency obligations on high-risk AI systems. So think things like preventing terrorist attacks. So it'll apply in 2026, but bans the use of artificial intelligence on social scoring, predictive policing, and untargeted scraping of facial images from internet or CCTV footage once new regulation comes in. So very heavy on data privacy in terms of this AI act, which is restricting essentially the use of data from people in public spaces, CCTV and the internet, and it being used to train models in that way. Yeah. And they, they green lighted this, I don't know, months ago. And I know they had originally proposed it, I think last year, and now they're one step closer to it being fully in effect. I think there's multiple stages throughout this process. I think there were some more urgent ones that they had called out that were going to be taken into effect sometime this year, but there, but most of it was going to be taken into effect by 2026. And I know they referenced GDPR as being a standard that a lot of people followed suit around data protection of the citizens of the EU. And, you know, if you're a company that leverages that data for anything, then you have to be compliant. And there are some pretty significant fines associated with not being compliant. So yeah, it's interesting. I think most people are just following it to see when it goes into effect and how it will go into effect and how they're going to enforce this, which I think will unfold probably in the next couple of years. Yeah, I think it I think it'll be good because a lot of governance right now is kind of like theoretical against regulations or it's building off data privacy. So I think it's good to have like something more explicit that people go off of because otherwise they're following things like NIST or other frameworks. But I wonder if this will help accelerate some of the implementation of the controls for teams that are kind of like, well, we could do it, but like there's no regulation that applies yet. So now I wonder if this will kick over or conversely, if it will kill a lot of AI use cases that could have leveraged this data because some organizations are also just avoiding anything that has risks associated with it. So it might also just dampen the ability for companies to do certain use cases with AI. Because there will certainly be a cascading effect where it's like they're focusing on the most severe kind of extreme use cases for now, but some of the kind of rules and guidelines that they set will start to trickle down to more general use cases and just the uses of people's data and, and how they're managing that. I mean, we're already seeing regulators catching up in the financial industries, especially in healthcare space too. I think expanding that out to manufacturing and the other more common industries just around guardrails that maybe some companies have had to self-impose so far, but coming out at the state by state level already, but eventually maybe a federal level thing for a lot of more traditional use cases out there too. Yeah. I think it's a good time for everyone to start thinking about their plan of just like cataloging and tacking a lot of this stuff. Because if you break all of the components down appropriately, data sets you're using, metadata about that data, including things like acceptable use policies, use cases, and how these algorithms are being applied to specific use cases, guardrails, expectations, risk management, constraints. I mean, if you have all of these things very highly documented and cataloged and tagged accordingly, you should be able to go back through all of your systems and see where your systems are deviating from the regulations that are being put in place. For example, if you have a policing use case for a system, an AI system that you've built, you know, that's going to be flagged with this EU AI Act. So, and of course, like the data that's being used and where those people reside. And, you know, there's all of these different kind of data governance and AI governance elements when we say it is super broad and ambiguous, but when you get down to the nitty gritty of it, really creating those components and cataloging them appropriately so that you can go back through and audit your own systems and you can make sure that you're compliant. I mean, you should do this anyway, but it'll, it will be very helpful when a lot of these, you know, a lot of this regulation goes into effect. It's a forcing function, right? I don't think anyone will disagree that they don't need to do it, but I think with this impending regulations coming, it's a bit it's a bit of a way to put a finish line towards it and start getting it set up if you don't have it together already. Also, we see a lot of teams just 
struggling to keep up with what regulations are coming out that we need to align to as well. And just like keeping tabs on the ever evolving regulatory requirements in their industry. That's why I'm so excited for Maria to join later with her work on the data strategy side with a lot of C-suite leaders. I think she'll be able to provide that insight too. That'll be good. And last but not least, I have just one more kind of news related to there was a, basically an AI Seoul Summit in Seoul, South Korea, where and we've kind of heard this before, but like the leading AI companies basically saying, hey, we're making a commitment that we will pull the plug on our cutting edge systems if they can't rein in the most extreme risks that are outlined. So we're talking Google, Meta, OpenAI, Amazon, a lot of the big players in the space. And it feels like we've heard this before, but basically voluntarily saying, we promise if it gets too extreme or if it gets out of control, we will pull the plug on those AI systems. It reminds me of that episode in Silicon Valley where he's talking about tethics, tech ethics. Oh my God, it's a good one. If you're listening, definitely watch this episode. It's really funny. But they're, they're basically creating this kind of like parody situation where a bunch of these like big tech companies are signing this like code of ethics and they're going to abide by it. And it turns out the guy that created this tethics is what he called it. He was just pulling from like mission statements of things like Applebee's and, you know, like random, <laughs> random company missions. <laughs> so I, so I feel like... Yeah, I Googled real quick and there's a Tethix LLC that does AI governance and privacy. <laughs> so, I just think it's, it was really funny because, you know, the episode was just trying to say like, okay, yeah, you can say you're going to do all the right things and you can put it out there. And like, there's a social pressure to kind of get on board. And as I'm reading through a lot of these news articles, it's the same thing over and over again. People are saying the same thing. It's the same rhetoric. It's the same sentiment. It's the same, like, oh, we have to have guardrails. We have to, it's like, yes. Okay. Yeah. We got it. You know, like I get it. Everybody wants that. Everybody's talking about it. If you've signed some piece of paper, that's cool. But like, you know, it's, what are, what are you doing to actually make that happen? And I think that's, so interesting because a lot of companies are waiting for the regulation to tell them what to do. And they're not really actually putting a line in the sand anywhere. Um, and it's so. not like it's an instant pull the plug thing either. Like calling back to the Microsoft story we just talked about where it's embedded in the machines, they're terming those as small language models that live actually locally on the machine and don't have to go to the cloud. So if you can use it inherently offline, how the heck do you pull the plug on those types of models that are living locally on people's machines in that way? Yeah, it's, I mean... You know, you can take a couple of different philosophical approaches to this too, just like what your, I think most people are just depending on fining people, putting regulations in place, putting the legal parameters in place, kind of the do's and don'ts. And, you know, others are basically saying there's reputational risk. And so people are going to try to do the right thing. And I think that's helping a little bit, but there's still a lot that most of the populace doesn't understand on what's happening. And so how are we going to create social pressure on companies where most of the people being affected don't understand what's happening? So, all right. I'm super excited about our guest joining us today. Uh, Maria Villar and I have known each other for a little bit, I think a little over a year now. We met actually through a mutual friend and since then, we've actually gotten to work with her a little bit, which is super exciting. Maria's got a really incredible background and career in data management, data strategy. She's been at SAP for 15 years, I believe, and recently is now has now left SAP. So she's going to give us a little bit of an update on what she's up to. She got we got connected with her through Wilda, the Women Data Leaders, Women in Data and AI Leaders group, and that was the group that Align AI participated in their ventures program, and we actually got to pitch back in New York. We talked about that in a couple of our episodes and promoted the new cohort of venture startups for this new, I think it's the second cohort now, and the applications are open for that. So definitely check that out. Um, but with that, Maria, I'm going to hand it over to you for a little bit of an intro on yourself, and then we'll jump right into the conversation. 
Yeah, thank you so much. And look, I've been a fan of the podcast now, even before I met you, Reagan. So super interesting. I, I always find I get a lot of value from listening to all of you, you know, discuss the latest. So thank you for, for, for letting me join and partake in this conversation. So yeah, I've got a, a robust, I would say, background in, in data, data management, data strategy, spent the 20 some odd years as a practitioner. So usually the first chief data officer of a company. I've done it a few times. I think I've earned the badges and scars, I say. And then the last few years of my career, while I was at SAP, I was coaching and advising SAP customers, but also did a lot outside of SAP. That's how I met Reagan. That's how I met Brandon. I am a member of the Women Leaders in Data and AI, which is a fabulous women's network, sort of like the chief. It's like a chief, but for for a, a women in data and AI, but hey, we take men as well. We think we we all need it in the world of advancing uh, equality in, in data and AI. So uh, Brandon got to participate as well as Reagan in our venture program. And yeah, thanks for the plug. The applications are open. Uh, if you have a woman owned, managed or led company, uh, we would love to have you be part of the 12 week program. So got a lot of experience, practical experience, and also now have a great network of other data leaders uh, who are going through kind of this AI revolution that we are all uh, going through now and trying to sort it all out inside our companies. Yeah, I think let's maybe start with that. I know that's a fun kind of big topic to start with, but you know, for a long time, data has gotten a lot of the budget inside of large enterprise organizations. Um, they've spent a lot of time moving data, curating data, governing data, and maybe a little bit of budget on AI. Depends on the industry, some industries more than others. Now that's starting to flood a lot more. Are you seeing the data budgets also proportionally increase to support AI initiatives? Or how are you seeing that balance start to you know, solidify inside of these companies? You know, I don't see the ba the budget growing significantly. What I see is the budgets shifting significantly, right? And you're right, where where there where once there was more emphasis on the date, the analytics, and then I think we've shifted a little bit more to back to the I call the classics of of, of governance because no, governance never has gone away, and that was a I, I think a growing. Uh, importance. It never went away, but I, I think people kind of felt like with analytics, you could solve all the problems of data and AI, you know, of data and governance and just kind of do it all at the semantic layer. And then we all realized, well, that really wasn't going to happen. And we went back to saying, nope, we, we actually need, you know, really good governance too. But then AI came and chat GPT just changed the world. I mean, I gave it, I gave this presentation at the beginning of the year that had all these great numbers about Hey, how yes, in general, budgets for data and analytics was increasing across all companies and and in annual reports. It's pretty interesting because PwC does this uh, survey. They don't really just talk to CDOs. They go back and look at annual reports and see how often data is being mentioned in annual reports. And there's a significant increase year over year over year over over the word data. And as a result, right, they, they kind of speculate that th those companies that even have chief data officers see it more often. So, yeah, there's been a growing improvement in all this. And but then AIs come and then you see the numbers and it's completely shifted to say, no, the investment is now in AI. And it's about about it may be a little bit more, but all of us have had to start reprioritizing other projects to try, try to do at least POCs around AI because everyone, you know, the company's all excited about it, but you're trying to tame it down and have real use cases and, and, and show the expectation and set, reset the expectation. And so a lot of POCs went on last year. And then this year, I think is more of the, how do you really show value in a real, in real production? So it's right in your, in the sweet spot of Align AI. I'm really excited for you. I know I reached out to you in the beginning of the year and I said, you guys, this is your year. You know, this is the year where where I the the momentum with our customers and what you're offering is is right there. So yeah, jump on it. Definitely. We have felt it. It is definitely a shift from last year for sure. 
when you talk about value, can you help us understand how are people thinking about value? Because we get very, very different responses. Some will find it too hard to actually measure. Some will find it, you know, they're getting really, really granular in how they're trying to measure it. Some are focused on just cost cutting, savings. You know, how do you think about or how are you seeing people talk about value associated with AI? So look, I've been talking about value for five years now. And I don't think AI, you know, just it just reinforces that value, business value is important. So, you know, I, I spent 15, my first 15 years trying to convince business executives on the importance of data, right? But I, I quickly learned that I had to change the way I talk about value in terms of the business. So I come from industry. I don't come from government. I don't come from other industries where it's all about, you know, kind of mission versus business outcomes. So for me, it's business outcomes as you can measure. And business outcomes are things that you can measure. It could be improvement in customer experience. It could be cost reduction. It could be upselling, cross-selling. It could be, you know, showcasing innovation, which is, I know it's hard to kind of measure, but some, some companies want to show innovation. So, you know, value is in the eye of the business and every company is different. And the best way for me, and, you know, I did a masterclass all on business outcome data strategy, which is to look at, uh, your annual report. Start with that. Start with what companies are saying to their investors about where their value statements are, and then kind of align, <laughs> align, align AI to those value cases. And if you do that, I, I really kind of feel like if you do that right, why do you need a business case? You know, you're just saying you've all, you know, we in the company already are saying we need to do this. This is just helping you do this in a better, faster, cheaper way. It's not like I'm trying to prove that you need cost improvement. No, you've already said you needed it. Now let me show you how AI enables that. And when we start talking that way, that's that I opens the door to business conversations as opposed to being those, you know, geeky data people that you want to uh, yeah, run away from who call a meeting and you're like, no, no, I'm really busy. But I, actually that doesn't happen anymore because AI is like a really interesting topic. So if you put AI in the meeting notice, yeah, everybody comes. But if you put data management or data governance, forget it, nobody's going to show up, right? But to your point, Maria, it's so necessary for these AI use cases. And since you get the opportunity to work with a lot of these C-suite executives around you know, setting the data strategy, like. How have you seen data strategies change even in the last couple of years related to the influence of AI? Yeah. So I, I, you know, I think the data strategy is becoming more important. There, the, this data strategy topic has kind of go, gone through a phase in and of itself. In the beginning, I would say five years ago, nobody had a data strategy. You know, mm -hmm. you had a data architecture, you had a data, you know, you had data use cases. But you didn't really have a data strategy that put it all together and mapped it back to business strategies and all that. Then there was a time when there was quite a lot of interest in having a data strategy in your company. And most heads of data tried to do that. I, I think that lost a little bit of, of favor because data strategies are hard mm -hmm. and you have to engage the business in them. Um, and sometimes they take, you know, a little bit of time. And I think sometimes we over-engineer the data strategy to pay, oh, I need to bring an Accenture in or a McKinsey and I've got, it's got to be a hundred page document and we have to do workshops and, and, yeah. all. and people are like, no way. I don't have the time, the budget, the business commitment to do that. And then, so now they went back to use cases, right? But with AI, there has been a resurgence in looking at AI in the context of the overall business strategy mm -hmm. and the data strategy. And I really do believe you, you, you want to take AI as a technology that enables what you already are trying to do in a faster, cheaper, smarter way. That doesn't mean you don't get to do other fun projects in AI, but in the business world, in enterprises, you first, you have to get funded, right? And so you get funded by working on real things and real problems and not just kind of doing the fun stuff. So I, you know, I always want to keep saying that doesn't mean you don't do some of the really fun, new, innovative things in AI, but you got to get the budget 
to at least start this the infrastructure going to start getting the technology going to hiring and all that and so you better like make sure a core part of what you're delivering has value that a business person is willing to fund not just for a POC but time and time again so it's kind of a balance but we got to be realistic that in our world we're always fighting for money and we're always fighting for budget so work on those things that you know the company really needs and then kind of save some money for the fun stuff where you can kind of experiment. Yeah, I always, I mean, I think about AI as being like, I don't know if this is a, a good comparison, but like cooking really fun meals in the kitchen. Like you've got all of your ingredients, you know, there are really nutritious meals that are really necessary for you. And then there are the fun ones that we we love. And sometimes the ingredients for that are special and hard to get to and more expensive and, you know, they're fun to do. But I, I find that when you try to like, let's assume you also had to garden all of your own food in order to cook all of that. Like, that's what I think about on the data side. And then nobody ever thinks about, well, the soil is off. And so I can't make this meal because I can't grow this particular ingredient because, and you start getting down into these like really nuanced little things that people don't, business people don't, or non-technical people don't understand. And then when you start talking about this data strategy, it's like, well, we can't cook these meals because there's all of these things that are not, growing properly. <laughs> and so how do you convince the business to either explain it to them and get them to understand or like, you know, just say, trust me, we need to invest in redoing all of our soil and then we can do all of these other things. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. You have to gain credibility at every step of the way when you do these kinds of jobs. But look, I, I guess what made what's made me successful and, and some of the transformation that I've done myself was really going from being data speak <laughs> to being business speak. And that's a transfer. And once you start speaking the language of business and then taking that and being able then to add the AI language to it, you know, you can open, you can open really doors. So, you know, I, I went back and got an MBA because I have a technical background, a technical degree, but I said, you know, I need to be able to talk to business people. And so I, I, you know, I, I know how to read an annual report and all that, but you don't have to, I mean, there's just, parts of the annual report that are like the letter to the, you know, to the investors. I mean, that's full of data rich topics. So yeah, I, we have to learn how to talk to the business in a way that doesn't make us boring. First of all, cause we are the boring data people. I mean, come on, let's, you know, we all think we're, we all know it's not, but to the business people, it's just, oh my gosh, these people are going to come in and I don't, I don't understand a word they're saying. And I'm just going to act smart. And so you have to really kind of meet them where they are and be able to explain them. And I've always lived under the premise that, you know, that smart people will do the right, will make the right decisions when given the facts. And it's our job to give them those facts, to make those connections with here's the business, um, here's the business outcomes that you want. This means within data ears, the following things have to be done. And so, you know, how do we work on this together, right? And I avoid words like governance, you know, and I avoid work like, for, and, and really just say, look, we need to manage data together to achieve the outcomes that we want. And AI is a technology that we can then leverage to do what we want. So it's kind of this complete conversation that we need to have in, in kind of in, in business terms. Does that make sense? It does. Yes. I couldn't agree more. I, it's so funny because I have a technical background. I was that person that got so excited and like geeked out over everything. And then, you know, people would kind of zone out a little bit as I'm talking about the details because I find it to be so interesting. And then starting, you know, Brendan and I launching Align AI, like you have to learn a whole other side of the formula and it forces you to really empathize with the people who are making some of those decisions. And I feel like that's actually made me a better communicator with non-technical folks because I am I can empathize with that because I'm actually on the other side now. <laughs> yeah, I forced myself, right? You know, like I did go back and get an MBA. I've, I've written a book. And if you ever have to write a book, forget it. That's the way that you really learn how to explain a difficult topic. I, I did this master class, which is available. So I've done all these things where I have to 
had to perfect or get better at articulating the the vision. But hey, I can go deep, right? I was it's so funny you remind me of this conversation I was having with you know a friend of mine, a colleague of, of mine. We were talking about LLM and RAG and you know hallucinations and all this kind. Of, and my husband is sitting next to me, and he's like. I don't understand a word you guys are saying. You know, we had gone on for 30 minutes and we were like, we were enthralled in this conversation. And he was like, I have no idea what you guys are just saying. So we speak in code to most people, right? Or, you know, you throw in data product, data mesh, data fabric, data. I mean, come on. So we just have to realize that 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 there is a nuance and a skill that we need to bring to the table. And it's it really isn't just the technology side. We need someone who's the translator. And I think that's, you know, the discussion, Reagan and Brandon, that we were having with you guys. So it's, it's like, how do you communicate what the value of your application, of your solution is? And in what category is Align AI? I mean, now it's a little bit more clear, right? It's about the, the management of a, a Align of AI projects. But in the beginning, I was like, okay, where is this? Is this fit in project management or is this fit in, you know, in governance or does this, where does this fit? And I, I think that's a, it's a really important skill we all need that we all have to learn in one way or another. Yeah. And it's funny. It's a little meta because we also have a lot of translation capabilities in our product now too, of helping business and technical teams work together to your point. So yeah. it's like this translation layer of here's what the business context is for the technical teams to build a solution that's useful for the business to adopt and trust. Like it's a back and forth that is really hard to manage and maintain because a lot does get lost in translation. So it is a really challenging problem companies are facing today. Yeah, and I hope AI, you know, sort of like I hope we apply AI to this problem too, because it, because one of the biggest challenges that we have is convincing the business to do the work they need to do on the data management side, right? It's the you know the, the data quality and the data process and whether they're stewards or not or whatever. But I kind of feel like if you are a business person, the last thing you want to do is be a data steward. Right. I mean, first of all, totally. what is that? Are you yeah. going to put it on your resume? Right. And it's like really tedious work that 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 you don't really want to do. And you're not going to get a value. I mean, you're not going to get a praise for it necessarily mm -hmm. as an extra work. But if we could create a digital, you know, an agent who is a digital data steward or something. So can they do 80 percent of what we're asking the business to do? And then, you know, that last, that last mile is the mile that we, you know, that, that we bring in the human. That would, I think, help our cause as well. Like, how do we use AI to manage AI and to manage all the kind of more tedious data management things that are necessary, but not quite that interesting to do? Totally. I know. I always tell people every time some, one of our customers is rolling out kind of like a catalog initiative or stewardship initiative. I'm like, ah, this, it's just the, it's the label job. Like nobody wants to go through and like, imagine giving someone the keys to a storage unit and saying, go organize the storage unit for the day. And you're like, I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many, I have so many stories that of that where, look, people say it's important. It is important. Everybody, and sometimes the business will say, we, we can't find the data and we need a catalog. Then you build a catalog and they don't come. Right. right. And, and then they, and then you're like, you just built this and now in a year it's outdated and because you, you haven't gotten the commitment to to the maintenance of that. And that's why, hey, can you do it in an automated way? Can you really? put it in production? So, you know, it, it becomes self-serving in and of itself. I, we have to solve those interesting those kind of problems to get the data to where we need to be. But I'm encouraged because I do believe now with A.I., there is more recognition that the underlying data infrastructure is important. I mean, there was a day where we felt like data quality wasn't important, that if you had enough data, you could solve data quality problems on your own, right, through some sort of magic. But now most of the folks that I work with, they know the data foundation layer is the starting point. Um, now they have to convince them to get to that level from a you know, infrastructure and budget, but 
there isn't this debate. Well, you don't need that. We're going to solve it all at the, you know, at the AI layer. No, no. Everybody's saying the data foundation is super important and we got to build that. So that's encouraging. We're not, we're not giving too much of a consistent message. It's just that it's a lot. Yeah. And I was actually having a good conversation this week with somebody who's trying to make that case, right? Like, Hey, we need to invest in the data architecture, data capture side, so we can power all this AI functionality and all this AI stuff that we need. What advice or recommendations do you have on how to make that case to the business? Cause these enablers are kind of hard because they don't understand why we need the new data mesh or the new, whatever capabilities we need around AI. Just any thoughts or advice for how to make that pitch? Yeah. I, I like to make the pitch. So I, in the background, you know where you want to go, right? You you know that you need a data mesh, you need an, the right data architecture and all that. But I won't try. I don't wouldn't try to sell it that way. I think most of the companies that try to sell it that way is really really hard. Again, I kind of go for go go to the outcomes that matter, and then say, look, in order to create this outcome, we need all this in the stack. And, you know, don't try to create, because sometimes there's this belief that, well, we, we need the foundation layer first, and then we have to start adding to the stack, right? I kind of feel like that's hard because now you have to validate that, la that foundation layer as opposed to saying, okay, here's an outcome. Let's go this way and build top to bottom. That doesn't mean you're not, you know, secretly kind of fault doing the foundation layer. It's just you're not selling foundation first and then everything else because people are like i can't wait for all you got for all this stuff to be done first and then do something do it now but can you do it in a way that is more that is quicker but is laying the foundation at the same time if you can if, we, if you could figure that out brandon i think it's an easier sell than if you have than selling the whole foundation first sure Definitely. Yeah. That's kind of, we've been advising like, Hey, collect the use cases, categorize them into what the solution they're going to need. Like how many rest bottles, how many batch bottles do we need real time? Do we need streaming? Like what do we need? Does that need to look like to make that case a little bit easier uh, to kind of justify, especially if you can show the bigger picture of like, not just this one use case has that huge ticket around it or that price tag on it. Like here's the big backlog of stuff that's going to be leveraging this architecture. That's a really good point too. But again, it's really use case based, right? And, and I, I, and I don't use the word use case. I mean, I use business outcomes, right? And you see me, you're like, I'm always adjusting my vocabulary because the use case is technical business I, to me, business outcomes is better. And does a you is a use case usually a business outcome? If you think about it correctly, yes. Hmm. Right. If you add the right, but so that's a really great suggestion, which is don't not just one use one business outcome, but if you know there's five or five departments that need a business outcome where AI could be a factor, group them together and then say all five of these require this layer and this layer and this layer. But again, it's not trying to say build this first and then we'll come along and and leverage it, even though kind of in the background, that may be exactly what you do. We are coming up on time, Maria. I wish we had more time. Uh, would love to have you back on a future episode just for folks who may want to get in contact with you or, or see what you're doing next. Uh, we always ask our guests, how can folks get in contact with you? How can they reach out? Well, LinkedIn is my preferred method, right? I also, again, I do have a business email, but let's try LinkedIn first. Yeah. And I would say if you can, my business outcome masterclass is on YouTube. Just look it up. It's, it's uh, 14 videos about two hours. And it's a good way to start thinking. I call it thinking with data ears, like li listen to outcomes and annual reports with data ears. And I, I think that's, you know, that, that's a good way also to get a little bit more deep into that conversation. We'll link that in our show notes so that people can get direct access to it on our show notes. So thanks yeah. for mentioning that. And your class on there as well. Thank you so much for your time today, Maria. All right, guys. This was fun. Thank Love you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for listening to AI or Die episode 14. We'll see you on the next one. Talk to you guys soon.